it's kind of like an organ. You have your different octave ranges, they go in feet. So like an organ has the, when you go to see a big church organ and it's got the huge, um, I don't even know what they're called, tubes of wood, yes. pipes, thank you. Uh, they're different sizes and the drawbars have those same kind of numbers on them as well. Um, so, you know, very high range. And that's just one oscillator you're hearing. Um, and as I sweep through the wave types from sawtooth, well, triangle, up to a sawtooth, and a square, and uh, what I don't know what this wave is, but it, I was calling it rectangle. What's kind of cool too is the early. Um, Mini Moog, this was all like, this particular button, the wave button, you had to switch between waves like you do switch between octaves. Now it's a rolling type of uh, knob, so you can actually get in between the two different waves, which creates some cool texture as they, you hear it sort of begin to gnaw against the other wave, I guess I would describe it as. just one oscillator and then um, you can ma keep making that sound bigger this is even before we start really messing with the filter and I can choose like to turn on my second oscillator and the second oscillator has another feature uh, for tuning so even though the Moog is mono you can actually tune the other oscillator to a different note and kind of create sort of like fourths or fifths or whatever you want it to do. Um, and again, you can choose the octave range. Just so you hear, here's octave, here's oscillator one by itself. Oscillator two is now on. They're both playing together. and. Um, you know, you have the ability to even choose how much volume of each oscillator you'd like. So if we just have oscillator running, two running by itself. Again, we're choosing the octave we want. And then you can do things like, you know. You know, cho choosing the pitch of that oscillator. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. That's the point though, is just like kind of experimenting with it until you get a texture or a sound that you like. And you know, for me, often I, I don't have a plan in mind. I just kind of am like going for it with my ear, whatever I decide, ah, that's kind of cool, I'll save that one. Or I don't like that, okay, start over. So in my live setup with corn, I, I use Ableton. And inside of Ableton, I house all of my soft sense and samples for the show. I might, you know, when I'm at home, I kind of build a rack inside of Ableton of all the different synths and keyboards I'm going to need. And you can do it in any program. You can use it Pro Tools or Logic. Um, it's just, for me, Ableton is something that I don't have to have a lot of other devices around in, in order to get it to work. So I started using Ableton because it was a way for me to compose on tour without having to bring a big Pro Tools rack with me. And now it's become kind of like my main uh, workstation, I guess. Um, and I, inside here, I mean, I have, what I generally have on stage, I have a lot more keyboards than just this. I've actually got about six different keyboards on stage. Um, I do have a Moog, I've got two Moogs, a Nord, um, something called a G2, which has been discontinued, and uh, a couple of different controllers. I have a really nice controller that um, you've probably seen used with Radiohead that has a ribbon. Um, oh, what are those things? It's called, it's made by a company out of England called Analog Systems, 
and it's it's actually called a French Connection. And it's designed after an old French instrument. I believe my pronunciation might be wrong, but the Odes Martineau, and it's just it it's there's a ribbon control that sits underneath the keyboard bed, so it actually has a keyboard on it. It can be played like a regular keyboard. But it also has this very unique thing to it, which is a, a string on a ring that corresponds to every note. Um, so it gives you one continuous note, goes as long as you want it to, and you can bend this note in either direction. There's no middle, and so it's very nice for doing strings. Um, for what I do with corn, which is a lot of half stepping, you know, so it makes it really nice to help emulate that guitar sound, I guess, of sliding up and down the neck. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely a uh, very unique controller that I love, but it can't go everywhere, you know, because it's pretty expensive. Um, but with Korn, when I'm playing a show, um, my controller is pretty much set up, and I, do, I also use uh, a launch pad, um, and the launch pad for me is used for everything from triggering my uh, segues like I was talking about, which are basically things like this. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, this segue might just be going while there's video happening or whatever, and um, at some point John will give me some kind of wink or a cue, at which point I will begin playing keyboards. Um, that wasn't set to the right sound, but... But I have everything from like, you know, it's just a keyboard that I'm actually playing the sound to samples. And triggering samples has nothing to do with playing harmonic progressions and a lot of times you know that's up to the user to figure out how they want to map those sort of things but it does come under the uh, umbrella of playing keyboards even though you know it doesn't have to do with playing notes. Well, I mean, with playing in a harmonic sense, you know, you're not playing chord structures. You know, you might just be laying them out in a way that, for me, I, I always have to think about it because I lay them out in a way that works for me. It doesn't necessarily work for the person who's coming in after me. You know, maybe I have designed something for uh, an artist and I'm not going to be the keyboard player. I'm just going, I just built it, put it together and then I hand it off to someone else and they have to kind of figure out what I've done. But a lot of what works for me, it's like thinking of your keyboard as like an MPC or something where, you know, you every key is a trigger. And essentially that's a lot of how the keyboard works.